sitting here in Canoga Park, California with Rada Bonificina. She is actually right on the street. She's my aunt. And so this episode is extremely, extremely meaningful and important to me. Thank you so much for sitting down with us, sitting down with me and letting us sit in your beautiful music room. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I love what you guys are doing. I think it's so important and so brave. I mean, and so cutting edge. I mean, really, really, really meaningful in a new way that's important. I it really is. think so. And yeah. you've, you've been doing this your whole life, I feel like. As long as I've lived, you have been doing just this, promoting and just making music and creating art. Art has always been important to me. Oh. Uh, from the time I was able to understand what I liked in life. Yeah. I knew I didn't like to eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like fish on Fridays. <laughs> Being Catholic, you have to eat Yeah. Just, the adults would make you eat with those little bones, and I was like, no. Oh, my goodness. Or, you know, somebody's thinking, no. So I was kind of like, uh, give me split pea soup. It was my favorite. Ooh. So my grandma yeah. used to ask me, we'd go to visit. What do you, what do you want me to make? I say, Split pea soup and lemon meringue pie. She would make it from scratch. That sounds delicious. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> but of all those things you didn't like, you knew you knew you loved music. I had always heard music. Always, always heard music. Always heard music. Um, always identified with it from the littlest time. You know, any kind of, it would catch my ear like, you know, songs from like that I never knew of, like how much is that doggy in the window, lady is <laughs> I adore you because I like the flirping and that kind of stuff. And <laughs> yeah. then, um, you know, or Sarah Vaughan singing broken hearted melody. So I used to like, uh 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 uh, uh. Yeah. yeah. So I would have to go to Catholic school. I'd walk myself to school. I was like eight, nine years old. I'd have a dime and a nickel would play a song. So I'd have to like, I'd get there before I go to school, I'd play her song, listen, then I went to the Catholic school. I would do that many days in a row. Wow, you're a rebel. <laughs> I just wanted to hear it. I just needed to hear that, uh, those sounds. Yeah. I didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. I just knew I needed it. I started playing piano when I was maybe uh, four and a half. Oh my goodness. But I stopped at five and a half. <laughs> Yeah, and cool. the substitute for that one, they gave me this one of those, I call it the Schroeder pianos. Yeah. And I, and because I was five and a half, I, and you weren't really allowed to talk to adults, I basically said to myself, this sounds horrible. I can't stand the way this piano sounds. Aww. So I just, I, would, I didn't touch it again for another nine years. Wow. Well, I mean, however many years later, you're a woman of many talents, many musical abilities. What is the instrument that sets you on fire, that really resonates with you, that you are drawn to the most? I know there's a lot. Well, you know, I'm real partial to the harp. Yeah. <clears throat> I really like the harp a lot. Um, I like the harp, not like the classical harp playing harp. I, you know, I can appreciate all the effort that people go to learn how to play that way. Yeah. But for my own self, I, I'm really more into a the mode, the modal sense of what you can create, and also the rhythmic patterns. That, so I think it would be closer to the African Kora type of where that's very, 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 very rhythmic that they're playing. So I'm trying to do that whole thing on a, you know, on a concert grand harp or on a semi grand, whereas like in Paraguay and other countries like that, mm -hmm. they play very, very, very fast. They have some of them wear um, picks on their fingers to make it da -da 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 but my whole thing is like a sonic wave and however the water sometimes it's calm sometimes it's not so it's i don't know if that really describes what's going on in my brain when i hear harp but i, I like can harp. hear that mm -hmm. and you originally grew up in brooklyn new york part time mm -hmm. part time mm -hmm. what I, oh go ahead i left brooklyn when i was five and a half and i was moved to um queens oh wow so that was a longer walk <laughs> <laughs> that was a longer walk, and uh, God, I, I was so I was so mischievous. Were you? Yeah. I believe it. <laughs> I was I, because you know, like um, there was a barn then in back of the house. It was uh -huh. a barn and with a hayloft. This is like in Queens, and so like wow. I would get the kids to go up. They would do a climb to the top of the barn, put on a, a cape or whatever you could fashion, and then uh -huh. jump down off the ladder onto the floor, <laughs> which is fairly dangerous. 
I was very mischievous, and I once found a bat on the way home from school, a okay. live bat. Okay. So I took the bat home, and of course everybody freaked out and <laughs> and said the bat was getting out of hair. And they, you made it your pet? No, they terminated the bat. Oh no! <laughs> it was terrible. I love stories like that, but I don't know. Even though you're my aunt, I still don't. I don't know how you made it over to the opposite coast. What brought you over here and? I was first curious about the West Coast mm -hmm. uh, when I was 16 mm -hmm. because on the news there was this whole movement happening at UC Berkeley and also at San Francisco State mm -hmm. on the Haya Cower, the president then and um, of San Francisco State and there was this movement and they were, uh, they were protesting everything and they also there was these people called hippies <laughs> and I was like curious. So I'm like, what are these folks about? So um, I had a summer job and at the end of the summer job, I took my paycheck and I bought a one-way ticket out to San Francisco. San Francisco, because I wanted to see what all that whole deal was about. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't see what the whole deal was about then, but I saw a little bit of it. And um, then finally, I never felt like the West Coast was someplace I would come and live. I always felt like it was, you know, I'd be bi-coastal. Yeah. And so then I had someone I grew up who was going to San Francisco State, and I'd come back and forth. And then um, in New York, when I was uh, became pregnant with Surya, mm -hmm. my um, the management I had back there, they suggested that perhaps it would be a better move just to, you know, not have a baby, just keep with the career. And I felt like, you know what, I'm out of here. Yeah. So I left. Good. So I left. Um, I left New York and I moved to California with a friend and um, fortunately the Lord was merciful and I received a grant from the California Arts Council uh, to uh, teach, be a teaching artist in the community. So that took care of all my, wow. you know, it was great back then. It was a lot of money to be able to do that for a whole year. And I did that and then uh, subsequently, after, then I went and moved down to Southern California when I um, met Alice Coltrane, Teresa Gitananda. I felt like my spiritual search was over. I didn't need to search for my spiritual family anymore. <laughs> we had a terrible thing we used to say about being on the West Coast. If you were a West Coast musician, we considered you kind of like you died. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because that, your fire, there was no fire in mm -hmm. the music. It was all this laid back, you know, Sleepy, whatever. Sleepy, beachy. Whatever, but yeah. um, that was our opinion. Well, you know, the opinion doesn't work anymore because, you know, music is so global and also, um, it's just so global and there's a lot to be learned from everything. Yeah. Uh, also, the culture in New York is, if somebody comes up to you in New York and says, hey, I want to record you, blah, 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 they're serious. Yeah. Out here, it's, it might be four months later and they're still, like, haven't gotten around to it. So it's so different. And New York, everything, if you say you can do something, you really can do it. But you're not going to show up and say, hey, well, I don't really know how to do it. I just learned that doesn't cut it. Whereas the West Coast has this other thing for session musicians that they're really good at sight reading. They're really good at creating that feeling, mm -hmm. very professional on that line. But in terms of that fire and spontaneity you would get from back east, it was completely different. So yeah, that was the, you know, the whole um, idea of paying homage to these guys, but also keeping it um, the discussions, the deep discussions we had about what is um, CP time? You know what CP means? No. Okay, CP time means colored people's time. Uh -huh. Okay, so colored people's time, what was that about? And we were like, what was that about? Like, okay. <laughs> well, what it meant was when we looked deep into it, the history, was that you weren't allowed to come together for like spiritual worship. Yeah. like when during the slave times right so they would still come together to join because you have to remember the people who were enslaved came from the african um continent but they were different uh, spiritual paths it could have been yoruba it could have been the muslim thing islam right. Right. they came from the, they didn't have that christianity thing mm -hmm. over there so then then you come over here you have the diaspora with the different languages that they're and then they're learning this kind of pig english kind of thing and then they're hearing these stories and they're trying to incorporate it so that they're 
so that their lot, at least they could survive because they, mm -hmm. they knew what was happening with the Native Americans. They were being killed. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, how come these people, how, we could, how did they survive? They kept their head down and then, yes, they, whatever it took to keep on going. But they also needed the, the music. So the music wasn't like, you know what? It was a great old thing. I was like, couldn't pay my bills and he like, took care of my knees. It was more like, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray, you know? And things like that. Um, Deep River, my home is over Jordan. You know, children, don't you want to go to that gospel feast, to that promised land where mm -hmm. all is peace? Or, um, you know, move on up a little higher. I'm going to sing and never get tired. Or, um, oh, Mary, don't you weep. Tell, tell Martha nothing more. Because Pharaoh's army, they all got drowned. So, oh, Mary, don't you weep. So these hopes, these incredible um, hopes. And so um, the whole thing was to have a private worship service. Mm -hmm. They would give different times for people on the coat plantations to show up. And they would specifically give the wrong time to the person who they thought would go back and tell whoever was in the big house. Uh -huh. So that they, so that's why they call color people's time, because gotcha. so that they could really weed out who was, you know, talking that. And then they would get filled with the spirit, and sometimes so much so where you just want to shout but you can't. Mm -hmm. So they would go into what was called hush corners. And the hush corners it would take like I believe they said. A bucket put it over their head just to contain the spirit that they felt and that carried over for many 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 decades after after slavery what was the most important thing to keep the people moving forward that one time they could they could sit in church they could beat all day long they needed it that much right. to, in order to go back out and do another week of being that in America so it was very important to me um, to bring out hope uh, during these times that we have so much um, narcissism, um, sarcasm, mm -hmm. um, you know, just mean-spiritedness, um, you know, just low morals. It's just like no respect for anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's terrible. And where do you get your hope from? Right. So where do you get to? But if you can just put on this album where everybody's, it's not operatized, you don't have a hundred dancers and everything. It's mm -hmm. something you can just put on in your house and you can just start singing and you can take courage and say like, Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. Mm -hmm. You know, children killing children as elders look on in fear. Right. Satan, we're going to take your kingdom down. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just to wrap up, if you had just one, if you had to leave this world with one message, just one takeaway, maybe a quote or just some advice that has stuck with you, what would you want to share? What Sai Baba said from India, um, do good, love God. It goes to everything. Nobody said you had to be an intellectual to love God or to do good. Nobody said you need money to do good. And God never ever asked you to pay him for anything. And so, but the only thing I think he wants you to do is pay attention to him. So it's a different kind of math, really different kind of math. And to live it on a daily basis is our test. So I, you know, I'm just really deeply appreciative of anyone who would um, support uh, this album in any way. Uh, we did have um, a friend of mine who owns, uh, his name is Glenn Gerson, and he owns a number of properties. And out here, he allowed us to have a, a, a record release party, and he wouldn't let us pay him one penny for it. It was in Malibu. And we did it as a soft launch mm -hmm. party. And we asked him to remove all the liquor from the bar, everything he did. Everything was moved out so that we could just have this beautiful occasion of um, of, of everybody just with the intention, the intention that it will do good for people, that it will do good and perhaps it would promote some part of them to actually understand that God is love and love is God. Carry on the Spirituals Volume 2 by Radha Bhattacina. Thank you again, Auntie, for sitting down with us.